and thank you to the nominees for your participation in this process and for your willingness to serve the American people. We find ourselves today in the midst of an unprecedented time in our nation's history. More than 100,000 Americans have been killed by a deadly pandemic, a number that continues to grow. 40 million Americans are out of work. And our entire country is reeling from the senseless killing of George Floyd. And the reality of unequal access to justice, health care, education, and economic advancement many Americans face because of the color of their skin. We have much work ahead of us. One of the issues before us today is the future of the United States Postal Service, an agency that is committed to serving all Americans in every part of the country, from urban centers to rural roads. And during this pandemic, the Postal Service has been an especially vital lifeline for medications, food, and other supplies for many Americans. Unfortunately, the United States Postal Service is in a dire financial condition, one that has been worsened by the coronavirus pandemic. The Postal Service estimates it will lose $13 billion in revenue this year and may run out of funds as early as September. A collapse or reduction of postal services would negatively impact all Americans, but it would disproportionately affect those who live on rural delivery routes, people with disabilities, and seniors who might have mobility issues. The Postal Service is often the only carrier that will deliver mail that last mile to rural homes. Supporting the Postal Service so that it can continue to offer equity and universal service to all Americans is of vital importance, especially now. The Postal Service, the District of Columbia, and our nation face big problems that our nominees, if confirmed, are going to have to grapple with, and it will not be an easy job. But it is a job of vital importance to our nation, and I applaud our nominees for their willingness to serve the American people in these important roles. Though this time is dark, I remain optimistic that we will find ways to solve our problems, that the resilience and resourcefulness of the American people will win out, and then we'll all get through this together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Um, my first question is to Mr. Moak and Mr. Zollers. Um, as I stated in my opening remarks, we find ourselves in a time of crisis due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Postal Service has projected revenue losses up to $13 billion this year and $10 billion next year. And there are concerns that it may run out of funds by September if Congress does not intervene. What in each of your experiences has prepared you to take on this massive challenge? And if confirmed, what will you do as a member of the Board of Governors to address the financial problems facing the U.S. Postal Service? Mr. Moak, why don't you go first? Senator, uh, again, I'm not a uh, postal expert, but I uh, would like to uh, give an example of where I've dealt with uh, issues like this in the past. If I was to pivot and tell you that uh, it's often uh, it's often hard to get uh, people to act, uh, to get groups to act collaboratively. And if you look at the challenges that are facing the postal uh, service, as you just pointed out, I believe uh, we need to do something sooner than later. And uh, right now, with uh, the challenges that they're facing, I think this is going to be the time that we can bring all the stakeholders together so that we can come up with a uh, solution collaboratively and put the Postal Service on the proper footing, uh, not only for this fall, uh, but the future so that it can, uh, that it can not just uh, uh, be sustainable, but it can actually thrive. I believe now's the time. And, and I take it you believe there are things in your past experience that will help you build that kind of consensus and action. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zollers. Well, Senator, this is, this is the big question, right? And uh, I'm a big believer in it's easier to solve a problem with a burning platform, and we certainly have a burning platform in front of us with the USPS. I wouldn't pretend to know uh, all the answers to this, but I can say that some of the challenges look very similar to my past life. 
uh, the challenges about declining revenue, increasing costs, um, cost disadvantage against the competitors, um, unfunded liabilities. Although I will say that that in my research into the liability situation looks like about two thirds of the liability is coming from healthcare and the other third from pension. The other thing that's actually good news is it's 85% funded in both cases. So I guess my answer is this is gonna be a complicated problem to solve, but I think if you break it down into the component parts and put together a strategy that's comprehensive that addresses all of the issues including, including the services we provide, the cost of those services, uh, optimizing the network, making sure we have effective technology and, and putting it together in a plan that everybody can embrace, I think we've got a very good chance of solving this. And I, I don't think uh, we have time to waste. Well, thank you for that. I have one more question for uh, Mr. Moak and Mr. Zollers, and I uh, will ask you to be relatively brief in your answers so I can ask one question of our uh, judicial nominees. But to Mr. Moak and Mr. Zollers, even as it struggles financially and faces some of the unprecedented challenges due to COVID-19 that we've discussed, the Postal Service continues to deliver mail and packages across the U.S. The men and women of the postal workforce are risking their health to serve their fellow Americans, and we have to find ways to ensure that the Postal Service can continue to serve the American people while keeping its workforce safe. So what role does the board play in protecting the postal workforce from this deadly virus? And how will you, if confirmed, prioritize worker health and safety? Mr. Zollers, why don't we start with you? Well, I think this has got to be a number one priority. Uh, the safety of, of the associates is always uh, at the forefront. Uh, we really don't have a postal service without the postal delivery uh, front end of this. And so it's got to be uh, a top priority right from the beginning. Thank you, um, Mr. Moak. I think we have to prioritize the health and safety of our customers, the citizens, and therefore uh, to protect them. We also have to prioritize the health and safety. Uh, we have a duty to do that to the United States Postal Service employees. And uh, by doing that, uh, we uh, achieve both of those. Uh, we've had these challenges before in this country, uh, back during 9-11 and other times. And I think, uh, I think if anything, we're up to that and uh, working with the board will be focused on safety. Well, thank you, I, I hope so. Um, and we may follow up with some questions for the record on that issue. Um, let me move to our other nominees for a minute to um, Mr. Robbins, Ross and Ms. Shapiro. Um, it's vital that all Americans are treated equally in our justice system, regardless of the color of their skin, and if confirmed, you will have an important role in ensuring the fair treatment of Americans in the DC Superior Court system. If confirmed, what measures will each of you take to ensure that all of those who enter your courtroom are treated equally? And we'll start with Mr. Robbins. Senator, I think any uh, individual who is honored to sit on a bench as a judge owes the people that come into his or her court an ability to put aside any personal bias they may have, to put aside their philosophy, their religious and political views, and to treat individuals based solely on the circumstances that have brought them to the court and apply the law as it is to be applied to address their circumstances. I'm, I'm pleased that, it, at least at an appellate level, I was able to do that for my seven years on the Merit Systems Protection Board, adjudicating over 4,000 cases. And I can honestly tell you there were times when I probably in my personal life would not have approved of the conduct of some of the parties. I would not have um, enacted the legislation that, that turned into statute that I was applying. But you learn to do that and you do it you do it uniformly and you do it fairly for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Ross. So I agree with Mr. Robbins uh, that it starts with the judge and it's your job as the judge to make sure that you're putting aside your predispositions and personal bias and ensuring that each litigant that comes before you is treated equally and fairly, that their matters are heard on the merits and uh, to set that same expectation for your entire court staff. Thank you and Ms. Shapiro. 
Um, Senator, I completely agree with the premise of your question that um, treating all litigants fairly is an absolutely vital function of the court. I would intend to do that. Um, and uh, I would also try to get as much uh, representation for um, pro se and, and uh, indigent parties that is uh, possibly available. Thank you. That's an incredibly important point, the last one, uh, because it really does make a difference to have representation in the courtroom. And we see increasingly increasing numbers of pro se litigants. Uh, so thank you very much, all of you, again, for your willingness to serve. And thank you, Mr. Chair.